Well, Ed Flemke, the racer, uh, as everybody knows, all you have to do is look at the history. He was one heck of a race car driver. And I can remember, and I'll tell you one story at Stafford that always stuck out in my mind about Eddie. I had just come there, I'm driving that purple 17, coming from Seekonk, London, all these racetracks that I won at, ran good, ran an all-star race at, at Stafford with my Camaro from Seekonk, finished third, really ran good. So I says, well, I know this place, right? So I get out in a feature, and I'm driving that 17, and Eddie's in the 2X, and I come up through the traffic, and he's leading the race. So the minute I get to him, I jump to the outside. And he hangs me out there for like 20 laps. So I wear myself out, plus wear my car out, and never get by him. So he just chugs away, and Freddie DeSaro gets by me, and... And I pull in and I'm third, you know, and I'm sitting in the car after the race and, you know, I drove my heart out trying to beat him. He comes walking over, not a drop of sweat on him, you know, and he said, listen. I says, yeah. He says, you should never try to outrun the rabbit. I says, what do you mean by that? He says, when you got up on the side of me, he says, I was just taking it easy. He said, I just let you stay out there. He says, you should have thought of a way to pass me before you just jumped up there. Never forgot that. He didn't even know me. All he knew is I was a little kid, a young kid. And, and Eddie was always willing to help people. You know, he was the master at that. If he seen you, even if he thought you could beat him, he'd still come over and he'd offer you help. And that's why, you know, over his career, he had so many young guys that would always hang around, would help him work on his car, because he was a, a master of teaching. He liked to teach. That was his thing. And a great guy. And, of course, I married his daughter. So, you know, uh, in the beginning, that wasn't always... <laughs> I don't think he was real happy with me at that point. But... Over time, you know, we talk about it and we laugh about it. He, he is actually, over time, when I went to Winston Cup Racing, became one of my best race fans. Sunday night or Monday morning when that phone rang, it was Eddie Flemke on the phone. Why did they do this? What happened here? You know, why didn't they do, you know, and he's, he's trying to run the race off the TV, you know, and I said, no, Eddie, that's, yeah, that's what happened. We had a bad pit stop. This happened, that happened. But that's the kind of guy he was in racing. You know, he, he would have been a, uh, a great teacher in school school or college because he, he got real enjoyment out of helping people and uh, you know like I say he'd help you and then you might go out and beat him but he'd never he'd come over and shake your hand and say good job but you know he, he that's how he was um, you know he had a different outlook you know I I never minded helping people but if I thought they could beat me I wasn't real interested in giving them much help <laughs> you know I like that winning part pretty good you know <laughs> And I started running Westboro right after I started racing. You know, I ran there for a long time and won a lot of races. And I mean, that was such a great racetrack. It was so much fun to drive. It was so fast for a little quarter mile. And then all of a sudden, you know, it, it passes through some hands. It had some different owners. You know, Dickie Williams run it for a while. Uh, Rabidou, I, I believe, the Chevy dealer in, in Worcester, he ran it. And, you know, they started to become troubles. And then, you know, what happens in racing today is some of the properties in the land is so valuable that their return on investment just doesn't work. And, you know, I think that was one of the biggest reasons that Westboro, I mean, if you drive down that Route 9 now, I mean, it's amazing the things that are there. And every time I go down that road, I know exactly where that racetrack is. And I look over there, and there's a Lowe's in there. You know, but, uh, you know, I hated to see that racetrack go because it was a great speedway. And, you know, through my whole racing career, I mean, I raced there a lot with Bugsy, George Summers, all them guys. And, I mean, what races we had there. Fats Caruso used to race. I always wondered this. What, what is, do you consider that or Seekonk your home track? Or, or both of them, really? Yeah, Seekonk. Seekonk? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, when I went to Seekonk, it was, uh, you know, it was... In fact, I just turned 16, and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Vandetti, you know, you talk about promoters, Dickie Williams, great guy, Don Honing, and, you know, those guys were great promoters. You can never forget the Vandettis. You know, they, uh, they were special people. You know, they ran a racetrack, and they really cared about their people that raced there, and they wanted a good show, and they were really concerned about their fans, and, you know, they, uh, they really helped me to... to uh, push my career ahead and uh, you know I'll never forget if you didn't have a good night and you know you didn't finish there was always a little something in your check when it came you know not not a lot of people did things like that but they did and uh, you know five championships and 
all the races that I ran and won. You know, I, I, I call that the number one place. And then, of course, when I raced Westboro, they, uh, they were involved in it, too. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a community deal where uh, all of them racetracks were great racetracks and great people that ran them. And, you know, in today's racing world, there's not a lot of them left anymore. And it's a shame, really. Let's talk about the Talladega win. T take us through the last couple laps of that race. Well, you know, that was, uh, again, it was, I think, uh, my 11th race and started 13th, whatever. There was a lot of crazy things that happened during that day. But, you know, uh, I knew I had a fast race car. You know, Harry Gant drove it before me, and it always ran good, and I, I ran it for, you know, 10, 10 races before that race or whatever it was. And, and, you know, we ran good. I was competitive. I had no idea how hard those guys raced in comparison to what I was used to racing. You know, we raced 50 lappers, 100 lappers, and you thought you raced hard for 100 laps. You know, those guys run really hard for 500 laps. So all of that was different. When we got to Talladega, I'd run Daytona a few times in the Modified. I've, I've, uh, I ran a lot of big racetracks. I always liked speed, never bothered me. And when I got to Talladega with that car, I got out and practiced. I could tell I was fast, but I couldn't pass. And we were parked in the garage beside of Buddy Baker. You know, and again, when we talk about things that happen to you in your life, you know, uh, there's people you meet along the way, and if it wasn't for Buddy Baker and Ricky Rudd, I could have never won that race. A lot of people don't know that. You know, why that happened is he was parked beside of me with the Woods Brothers car. And, and he got out of his car and I said, you know, hi, buddy. And I'm Ron Bouchard. And, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I've been watching you because he didn't run all the races back then. I said, can I ask you a question? So I asked him. I said, I get out there and I can't pass anybody. I know I got a fast car, but I can't get by him, you know. He says, jump in that thing. So I get in the car and he takes me out there and he showed me what I needed to do. Then we came in and we sat on the bench. And he gave me a scenario. And you know, people are sometimes hard to believe, but he played out all the scenarios that could happen at the end of that race. In case if I got into one, I'd know what to do. And he played out that scenario. If you're third, this is where you want to be and this is how you want to pass. And that is no kidding. Because when I got to that point, I knew what I wanted to do. Now, if I didn't have his help, I might have made a mistake. You know, because I know once during the race I tried to pass and I did make a mistake, and I went way to the back. And it was only five or six laps to go, and I'm sitting back there. Now I lose the draft, and here comes Ricky Rudd up in the mirror. He gets up on my bumper. He's five laps down. He pushed me back to the pack. NASCAR come on the radio and said, tell him to get off Bouchard's bumper. So he backed away with two to go, and I sat there, and I waited till that time when, when Terry jumped to the outside of Darrell. And Darrell, at that point, was busy taking Terry to the fence. And the dust was flying, and I waited till they got side by side, and then I turned that thing left at the right point and knew I had a long ways to go before you get to the start-finish line. And that's how you can win the race at Talladega. And I would have never knew that if it wasn't for Buddy Baker. Can you just speak to staying close to your roots while, you were, while your cup career was blossoming? Well, you know... Uh, Modified racing, you know, was, you know, for so long I was in it, and, you know, and again, I guess someday we have to count up, but I think I won somewhere around 300 racers or something over my career in Modifieds. Well, when it come time to leave, it was really hard to get away from them things, you know? And Bob Johnson used to say, you need to stop driving them things. You think this tank is going to handle like one of them things? And I said, well, you know, it, I, you're probably right. It probably didn't help me, but... Anyway, I'd come home and, yeah, I'd, I'd run races all over the place. And Lenny Bowler would always keep a car for me and Bobby Judkins. And I'd come back and I'd win a race at the Speed Bowl. You know, I'd go to Seekonk for Anthony and I'd win a race there. And, you know, I'd gone to Monadnock. And I just, when I come home, it was really hard to get away from that. And the people, you know, and uh, there was always somebody wanting me to, you know, and again, I didn't drive everybody's car, but, you know, like I say, Bowler and... Uh, Judkins always had a car for me, and I just enjoyed coming back to see the people. And then after I won the race, I mean, it was just amazing, the fans. You know, I think they told me at Thompson, man, they stopped the race because the, the end of the race was playing. And, you know, and, and uh, everybody supported me so much back here, it was hard for me to leave and, and uh, say, okay, I'm all done with that. And I stayed pretty active for a long time. Got Bobby Allison to drive one of my cars at, at Martinsville. And, you know, a lot of neat things we did together, you know. Uh, do you keep up with the modified racing these days? I do. 
I do. I don't, uh, you know, it's funny when you've done it for so long, I don't enjoy going to watch. Really? Yeah, I don't. It's, it's crazy. You know, my son raced for a while. I hated to go watch him race. I told Paula, I said, Christ, I can see what my mother and father went through with me and Kenny out there. Right. You know, I, I, right. I'm a wreck. You know, so yeah, I, I, didn't, I don't enjoy going to, it's funny, I, you know, I've been to so many that I really don't enjoy to, uh, well, I guess I'm not a spectator, I guess is how you'd say it, right? right. And when I go there, you know, and, and sometimes people will say, you know, you know, how did you quit the way you quit? And how did you never get talked back into going? And had plenty of people trying to talk me back into going, and I never went. And I always said, if you've ever smoked, you know how hard it is to quit smoking? So you say to yourself, what if you just had one? Yeah. So that's what I say to myself. You know, years back I smoked. I know how hard it was to quit. I said, if I go to a racetrack, it still makes the hair on my skin stand up when I hear them. And I say, you know, why don't you jump in? Drive my car. Just take some. No. Because I know what it's like. It'd be like taking a puff on a cigarette. So that's how I quit. When I said, that's it, I'm done. I was done. And... Uh, you know, as we sit here, I've uh, had plenty of things to keep me occupied. You know, being in the car business and and, uh, and and working with people in cars. That's been my whole life, people in cars. 